Well, this took way longer than I expected. I recorded the commentary the day after I uploaded part 1, but then the video took 2 weeks to complete and I'm sorry for that. Anyway, since this is another pretty long video, let's start right away. Today we will talk about the pre-Arkham War Age, the Arkham War and the post-Arkham War Age, as well as everything about Caria. Like I said in part 1, this video doesn't contain any new information that we obtain in version 3.1, so that no one gets any spoiler by watching this. If you haven't watched part 1, you can find the link in the description box. As always, this is a theory video. Even though I'm using information available in the game, I will add my own personal thoughts, theories and deductions to fill in the blanks, so not everything I'm going to say is part of the official lore of the game. The pre arkham War is very short since we don't really know much about what happened back then, probably because nothing much happened in the first place. The first day we have about the pre arkham War age is 6000 years ago in Liyue, where Rex Lapis was born. Much later, probably a few millennia before the Archon War, he raised Mount Tianhong, he quelled the seas and lowered the tides. Then he befriended the Lord of Dust, Gui Zhong, and they moved both of their people north of Mount Tianhong, founding the Guilei Plains or Assembly. The name was a mix of Gui Zhong's name and Rex Lapis's name, which was probably already Zhong Li. According to Soraya, the Lisha region, so Duinyu ruins, Lingju Pass and Qin Shu Pu, was ruled by an unnamed evil god. About Inazuma, we kinda know that in the beginning the Tanuki ruled over the land. Then the Kitsune arrived by sea, they fought each other and the Kitsune won and they received rulership over the giant thunder Sakura, which is obviously not the sacred Sakura tree since we know when that one came to be. On Surumi Island, the pre-Thunderbird civilization was forced to come to the surface and they started worshipping the Thunderbird. They were scared of her, but they interpreted her every move as a sign for something, while on the other hand, the Thunderbird, Kanaka Patsir, couldn't care less about them. The people started gathering her feathers and they invented the Maushiro to be able to locate each other in the fog. In Mondstadt there were a few ancient civilizations that later disappeared like the one that grew Cecilias in greenhouses in Windwheel Highland or the one that established the Zomernachskarten at Starsnatch Cliff, which later became the domain Midsummer Courtyard as it fell. The Caribbean built this Mondstadt, nowadays Storm Terrace Lair, and Andreas lived around there as well. In the wiki page they said that Andreas received these frost powers from an ancient god, but I'm 99% sure that that's wrong, and Andreas' description in the Adventurer Handbook refers to his current power to take the shape of a wolf and defend his lupicle. Also, the ancient god was probably Isaroth at this point, since in my last video we saw that she's everywhere. In Sumeru, which was a huge desert and nothing more, there were three friends, Ruka Devata, the Scarlet King and the God of Flowers, and they just lived happily with each other. There isn't much to say other than the fact that the God of Flowers, the Scarlet King and the Genie built Ai Hanum, the city of amphitheaters or the city of the Moon Maiden in the desert. When we talk about the Arkham War, we shouldn't think about a specific time period during which every god in every nation was waging war. Each nation has its own version of the Arkham War and sometimes there wasn't a war at all. The goal of this war was to establish Narkon, a god that prevailed over the other gods. It doesn't matter if they were killed, they chose to die or they simply gave up on the seat for someone else. Some gods weren't even interested in fighting and some just left the Vat and moved to the Dark Sea, a place outside Celestia's jurisdiction. Every nation's Arkham War also began and ended in different moments, but we know that it definitely ended 2000 years ago for every nation. We kind of know that the Arkham War was pushed by Celestia itself, but the actual reason why they did that is still unknown. In Liyue, we can guess when the war started because one of the very first victims was sadly Gui Zhong. As soon as that happened, Rex Lapis, held by the Adepti and by the god of stove Marcosius, aka Guoba, moved his people to where Liyue Harbor is now and he signed a contract with the Adepti to defend the people of Liyue. Since we know that the first contract to defend Liyue was signed 3700 years ago when Liyue was founded, we can deduce that the Archon War may have begun not long before, maybe a century or two. Once the Millilith Brigade was established, Rex Lapis joined the war. He also found and helped Ashdaha, who in turn helped Rex Lapis and the Adepti in the war, until erosion made him go berserk and had to be sealed. Rex Lapis fought many gods like Ozayo, Chi, but also Orobashi. Most of these gods were buried under his gigantic stone spears in Guhin Stone Forest. 
The war ended around 2600 years ago because one of the statues used in the quest, the Chi of Yore, that sealed the remnants of the god Chi and Mao Chinzo, had to face the windswept runes, which is the Carabian's monster, and we know it fell 2600 years ago. I would guess that Chi was sealed after the war ended, so when the Carabian Monsat fell, the Archon War in Liyue should have already ended not long before. About Monstat, according to the biography of Gunhildr, her clan was born 3000 years ago in the middle of the Monstat Archon War, so the war began way before that. The Archon War was fought between Andreas and the Carabian, or at least Andreas wanted to fight, not the Carabian. The Carabian was in his Mondstadt and he was worshipped by his people, but that's only what he thought. In reality, his people worshipped him because they had no other option since they were prisoners of his wind barrier around the city. Andreas, the King Wolf of Boreas, tried to harm the Carabian's Mondstadt, but he never managed to do that because of the wind barrier. Basically, outside of all Mondstadt, the land was completely frozen by Andreas' powers. The head of the Gunhildr clan, who used to serve under the Carabian, realized that the god was a tyrant, so he took his clan and decided to leave. Once outside the barrier, they were on the verge of freezing to death until a wind spirit, born from the wind barrier, heard their prayers and decided to help them. The clan began to worship the wind spirit and their affection became the wind spirit's power. He also gave Gunhildr, the daughter of the head of the clan, the power to protect. When Gunhildr became the clan's leader and the first priestess, Barbados, the wind spirit, together with the nameless bard, the wandering red-haired warrior, the Imulauker clan and the archer Amos, who was the Carabian's lover by the way, challenged and defeated the Carabian 2600 years ago. Andreas, realizing that his power couldn't nurture life but only destroy it, decided to let his physical body die and his powers were absorbed by the land. When it comes to Inazuma, I am a thousand percent certain that the story of A sacrificing herself to make Makoto the Archon is just a fantasy novel, not the true events. If the power acquired by becoming an Archon could bring people back from the dead, why wouldn't have A revived Makoto when she found her dead in Kanria? Also, no one has ever completely come back from the dead in Tevat. Are you thinking about Chichi? She's a zombie. A is definitely not a zombie. Also, like I said before, to become an Archon you don't really need to wipe out every single god. If they did that, since gods are not immortal, once they died there wouldn't have been anyone to substitute them. Anyway, we don't have dates for the Inazuman Archon War, but we can somewhat guess the period through Kapatsir and Orobashi's stories. In the quest The Sun, Wheel and Mount Kana, we learned that the Thunderbird told Ru that she had heard the melody sung by the blue flying dragon of the far north, which is the Valin. While in Breeze amidst the forest, we also learned that Dvalin met Barbados when he had already become the Anima Archon, which means between 2600 to 2000 years ago, when the Inazuman Archon War ended according to a preliminary study of Sangonomiya folk belief. Back to Tsurumi Island, Ru sang a song to Kapatsir and she really liked it. Ru promised her he would sing another song for her when they met again, and he named the Thunderbird Kana Kapatsir. At this point, it should be pretty clear that whenever a person takes the role of the Sage in Tvat, it means they'll do something extremely stupid along the way. The Sage of the Village found out about Ru and Kapatsir's special connection, and he had the most brilliant idea to sacrifice the young boy to please the Thunderbird. We do have to point out the fact that Ru himself thought that it was a good idea as well. Anyway, when Kapatsir saw Ru's blood in the Omen of Thunderstorm, the Ritual Goblet, she just lost it and she wiped out the entire civilization, and cursed them to fall under the eternal catastrophe until she could hear Ru's song once again. That's why the same day kept repeating over and over again when we got to Tsurumi Island. She then left Tsurumi Island and went to Serai Island, where she was slain by Raiden A. Orobashi's story began in the middle of the Archon War. He tried and failed to defeat both Morax and the Redden twins, so he was forced to flee into waters unknown as per the Oathsworn Eye description. He then unintentionally fell down into Enkanomiya where he took shelter inside a cavern, for an unspecified long time, until a child ventured beyond the corners of Enkanomiya to look for a dragonbone flower. There he found Orobashi and he asked him to become their god. Orobashi accepted, he put an end to the Sun Children tyranny, he defeated most of the baptismal bishops, brought new laws and taught the people the Narukami style language and traditions. Orobashi started to learn Enkanomiya's history from the people and then he stumbled on the book Before Sun and Moon, which as we know very well speaks about the ancient history of Tevat that Celestia wanted to keep a secret. 
Orobashi then personally led experiments on the baptismal bishops to prevent the prophecy of the dragon sovereign of waters return. The experiments forced the evolution of the bishops, and they lost their pure elements, so the dragon sovereign could not come back. Orobashi then used the coral that naturally grew on his body to create an island on the surface, Watatsumi Island, and he guided the people outside. He taught them how to farm and how to smelt. Because the land wasn't exactly fertile, the people begged and convinced Orobashi to invade and conquer Yashioiri Island. Here comes the catch. When Orobashi read Before Sun and Moon, both him and the people of Ekonomiya were pronounced guilty of the following sins, four counts of the sin of profanity, and a further eight counts for the sin of deceiving living soul by Celestia, and we all know what kind of consequences that would imply. Orobashi instead took on himself the whole transgression of his people and decided to sacrifice himself for them. I believe this is also the reason most of the sin shades exist in Ekonomiya, and they also know everything about the hidden past, while the people on Watatsumi Island don't know pretty much anything at all. The sin shades are after images of the people of the past. They have existed ever since the Dainichi Mikoshi was built, but here's my theory. Since no one had to know anything about the pre-Celestia history, the people needed to forget what they knew, otherwise Arabashi's sacrifice would have been useless. Sin shades are the product of a ley line disorder, and we know that ley lines hold memories. In the loading screen, we also see that Istaroth, what's new, was involved in the creation of sin shades. I think that, thanks to Istaroth, the compromising memories were taken away from the people, and they were left in Ekonomiya in the form of sin shades, the manifestation of people's transgression. This also prevented those memories from going back to the ley lines and be reused in the cycle. As a consequence, the people of Watatsumi Island could forget what they shouldn't know, and Ekonomiya was later sealed off completely. The Sin Shades have been reliving the last day before they left for the surface over and over again for thousands of years, more or less like the spirits on Tsurumi Island, while only Aru's Sin Shade is aware of what he is, because they needed someone to explain that the secrets of Ekonomiya must never be told to the outside world. Back to Watatsumi Island's history, Orobashi taught his people how to fight and they invaded Yashiori Island. The Raiden twins heard about it and Raiden A slew Orobashi, or at least Orobashi let her slew him because that was the way he chose to sacrifice himself to save his people from heavenly retribution. Both Orobashi and Kapatsir were slain around the end of the Inazuman Archon War, and we know that Raiden A slew every single god inside, regarding them as obstacles to progress. In the end, Makoto became the Archon while A became her Kagemusha, because she didn't see herself as the right person to be an Archon. About Sumeru, the Subwood Blade tells us that of the three friends from before, one died. This was the God of Flowers, the Lord of Joy and Happiness and Mistress of Dreams, the Sili who survived the disaster that fell on her race. She's officially believed to have died because of the malice of the burning sun and yellow sand, but in reality she decided to die, just like the flowers blossom so that they may enjoy a spectacular death. Or, more specifically, she thought that her spectacular death would have allowed her to be eternally remembered. The Scarlet King, the Lord of the Desert, who was in love with her, simply lost it after her death, especially because he never knew that her death was intentional. Ruka Devata couldn't stand this anymore, so she moved to a corner of the desert where she created the forest for her people. The Scarlet King, Alachmar, or King Deshret, and I still think his Arsketia name is going to be Amon, was driven to madness, and he created an ever youthful dreamland in the center of the desert where water sprang up. I believe this is going to be a huge mirage, since the Dreaming Steel Bloom tells us that the Scarlet King uses his powers to create eternal illusions in the sand as a defense mechanism against grief, specifically his own broken heart. He was later deceived by his three retainers, the Goat King, the Ibis King and the Crocodile King, to basically do more or less what Raden A did in Inazuma with her body and consciousness. The Scarlet King built a huge maze in which he trapped himself. There, he researched forbidden knowledge to find an elixir that would allow him to separate his mind from his body. When he managed to do it, his body was left to rot on his throne, while his mind was forever merged with the souls of the millions of people in his kingdom. Because he was driven by madness, his entire kingdom fell with him. Later, his royal city collapsed and, together with the majority of his people, was buried beneath the sands. The few who survived were made blind and mute, and they were punished with ignorance because they also benefited from the forbidden knowledge that Scarlet King researched. 
about Ruka Devata, we know from the lower coronet of the Deepwood Memories artifact set that when she created the forest, she later created a device, Faruna, to summon the rain. That's also when Viagara, the king of the forest, also called the tiger, was born. Not long after that, the palm grenades fell on the land and they gave birth to the Aranara. The lord of the forest blessed the Aranara under the fane of Ashvata and she made a pact with Ruka Devata to share the forest labyrinth with her and the Aranara. There have been multiple generations of kings of the forest and each one of them built their own palace until the last king simply joined them all and created a maze in the forest. Anyway, I believe Ruka Devata simply became the Dendro Archon just because there was no one else left. Let's talk about the post Archon War Age. About Sumeru, I guess we can only say that Ruka Devata created the Academia and we don't really know much about it. In Liyue, we just know that Rex Lapis made a contract with the Yakshas to deal with the hatred of the defeated gods who didn't want to accept defeat. In the beginning, the strongest Yakshas were Bosatius, Indarius, Bonanus and Menogius. Rex Lapis then saved Alatus from an unspecified evil god who forced him to perform cruel and violent acts. Rex Lapis gave Alatas the name Shao and he joined the other Yakshas. The Karmic Death, the evil energy they accumulated, brought the Yakshas to their demise, exception made for Shao. Indarius went mad, Bonanus and Menogias killed each other, unless Menogias is actually Capitano, Bosatius instead just left the Yaksha and disappeared only to reappear during the Cataclysm in the Chasm. In Mondstadt, Barbados moved these people to Cider Lake, and later he met and befriended Valin, an animal elemental being, which was later tasked, before Barbados decided to disappear, with the protection of Mondstadt as the Dragon of the East, together with Andreas as the Wolf of the North. This last one has also become a title, the Knight of Boreas, that has been passed down and is now held by Varka, the Grandmaster of the Knights of Avonius, wherever he is nowadays. Barbados went MIA until a thousand years ago when he woke up only to find Monster tyrannically ruled by the Lawrence clan. Generations before Barbados woke up, a clan of descendants of Murata, the Pyro Archon of Natlan, left their nation and began wandering the land. Ten years before Barbados woke up, they encountered Ursa the Drake, an evil dragon who hounded and starved them for four days until they ended up in Mondstadt and were turned into slaves. Ten years later, Barbados finally woke up and witnessed what became of Mondstadt in his absence. He met Vanessa, a Muratan woman enslaved by the aristocracy, who was fighting in the arena to earn freedom for her clan. During the Ludihar Pastum, she protected Venti, the name Barbados was using while incognito as a bard, and because of that, she and her clan were punished. She ended up having to fight Ursa the Drake, so Venti showed his true identity as the Animal Archon, he helped Vanessa defeat Ursa the Drake, who ran away, and the aristocracy's reign of terror was over. Vanessa asked Venti to ascend to Celestia, and when she did, she was really disappointed with what she saw. Celestia looks a little too much like a panopticon, a kind of 18th century prison where the prisoners can always be observed by a single security guard in the tower in the middle, while the prisoners are not able to tell whether they've been watched or not. Anyway, as she ascended to Celestia, she was transformed into a falcon and became the Falcon of the West, which now represents the Knights of Avonius since it was founded by Vanessa herself. Vanessa is also the Lion of the South, this title, now called the Lion Fang Knight, similarly to the Knight of Boreas, is passed down and is now held by Jean, the active Grandmaster of the Knights of Avonius. This means that the Grandmasters can either be the Knight of Boreas or the Lion Fang Knight, so they can be either the Wolf of the North or the Lion of the South. Hence, the Four Winds were officially established. In Mondstadt's post Archon War Age, we also need to remember that both the Wind and the Time Gods were worshipped together. But then, for whatever reason, the people simply stopped worshipping the god of time and completely forgot about it. Now let's talk about the nation you all have been waiting for, Kanria. We don't really know that much about Kanria, so this entire section of the video is basically 90% personal theories and guesses. Kanria's story goes from some time before the fall of Salvindagnir, so the Envoy Age, and ended 500 years ago with the Cataclysm. It was a nation that decided to develop without a god, which I don't really think it necessarily meant that they hated or despised the gods in general. Kanria is said to have been an underground nation, which is something that still troubles me. When Lumin witnessed the destruction of Kanria, we clearly see that she was on top of a hill and there was a sky behind her, so she was on the surface. 
Caria was below her, but that doesn't scream underground to me, since we could see the sky and the moon. Two options here. Either Caria was something like the Netherlands, so underground actually meant below sea level, or Celestia destroyed everything, even the land that acted as the roof of a huge underground cavern, but that doesn't feel right to me. Anyway, we also know that the land was not very feral and had few natural fauna. That's why they used Chemia, an alchemic form that focuses on the creation of life. Caria was ruled by the Eclipse dynasty, and their king was the one-eyed Ermen, who was later substituted by the Albrecht clan, Kaya's clan, when his strength failed him. They became the regents even though they were not royals, and we can deduce that they ruled during and probably a little after the destruction of Caria, because the message in the break says that they couldn't restore Caria to life. Ermen's strength failing could also be interpreted as him becoming a monster because of the curse put on Caria. Caria didn't interact with the heavenly envoys and wasn't affected by the Archon War at all, for obvious reasons. The only reference we have about this nation during the Archon War is in Enkanomiya, when they showed up on the last day before the people definitely moved to Watatsumi Island. They pretended to be there just for a visit, but they were on a mission to steal the book before Sun and Moon. How did they know about that book since it had been buried in the abyss for thousands of years? Well, let me tell you my theory. I believe that Caria was built on one of the ruins of the Primordial Unified Nation, which Enkanomiya and the Upside Down City in the Chasm were also part of. This could mean that maybe they found something that hinted at the existence of the book, what was written on it and where it was, that's why they already knew what they were looking for and what they would have found. Now, let's go back centuries, probably even a thousand years before the Cataclysm. Two meteorites entered the Master Domain Tvat. My theory is that they entered through the gates in the heavens, traveled through the abyss, because Tevat is upside down, and ended up straight in Caria, probably because it was underground, so closer to the abyss. One meteorite um, opened, cracked, hatched, I don't even know what verb to use here. Anyway, Lumin came out. She befriended the people of Caria, and this is what I believe, she shared her knowledge with them. From that knowledge, the people probably developed or enhanced Kenya. I mean, when Albedo uses Chemia, there's this gold light that really looks like the twin's unique element color. Anyway, centuries after, we are now around maybe 510 or 520 years ago, Lumin began traveling around Tevad with her companion, Dainslev. In the meantime, Rine Dottir, or Rhine Daughter, was born and she started tinkering and experimenting with that knowledge that Lumin shared. Rhine Daughter started experimenting with life itself, creating monster, and she also wanted to create an actual human being. Remember in my last video when I said that the Primordial One and one of the Shades created bodies for the souls that were in the Ark to inhabit? This is what I meant. In Albedo's character story 3, Rhine Daughter told Albedo that the Earth is the basis of all life. This is a clear reference of the Book of Genesis when God created Adam's body with the dust of the ground and breathed life into it. So you can see how creating a synthetic human being would be considered a heresy. Another reason why I believe the destruction of Caria was caused by Lumin sharing her knowledge is because of Piero's story. He was some kind of counselor of the Eclipse dynasty, but he didn't join hands with the Abyss Order even though they both want to defeat Celestia and avenge their people. Piero realized that the sages were about to do something really bad, as all sages do, which would have brought forth the Heavenly Wrath, but no one listened to him. Since the Abyss Order, who follows Lumin, and the Fatui, who follow Piero, don't work together, I think that the two leaders just can see eye to eye, probably because Lumin gave those sages what later tore away the Veil of Sin and let monsters from the Abyss inside Tevat, and as a consequence caused the destruction of Caria by the gods. At that point, Lumin, maybe together with Dainslev, came back to Caria, and we know what she saw. She started running towards the city as everything was being destroyed because she needed to wake either up from the meteorite that was in Caria and leave the planet. This is when the two stars left Caria and went to the closest place where they could enter the abyss, and it seems they headed for Musk Reef. They traveled through the abyss, that's why Ether has memories of it, and they got out of the domain, but just outside the gate in the heavens, they found the sustainer of heavenly principles, who stopped and caught them. Lumine reawakened pretty fast because we know she went to Sumeru and repaired Varuna in the aftermath of the Cataclysm, hence the name Nara Varuna. She was probably trying to make up for the desolation Caria brought to the entire planet. Either, on the other hand, reawakened 500 years later. 
we can interpret this in two ways. Either Lumine was full power since she woke up centuries before so she managed to free herself from the cubes, while either just woke up so he didn't have the time to get his full powers back, or, and this is what I believe, the sustainer decided when and where the twins had to be reawakened because she is also trying to bring Celestia down, especially because, like I said in part 1, I believe her to be one of the primordial shades. This way, the twins will get two different kinds of powers, the power of the abyss and the power of the gods, so that they can join them together when they'll challenge Celestia. And that's it, I really hope you liked the video and that it was worth the wait. As always, if you have questions and or theories, let me know in the comment section and let's talk about it. I will eventually talk about the entire updated lore of Sumeru, but I decided to wait until version 3.2 so that we get more information and we can theorize a little better. I also have a nice and fun idea for my next video and I'll start working on it right away, so if you're curious, stick around. If you liked the video, don't forget to leave a thumbs up and if you enjoy Genshin Impact Theory videos, subscribe. I will try streaming a bit in the future, so I hope I'll see you there as well. Anyway, until next time, over and out.